Hey everyone, welcome to Being Well. I'm Forrest Hansen. If you're new to the podcast, thanks for listening today. And if you've listened before, welcome back. The single most common email that we've been receiving recently has been some version of, I am really concerned about everything that's going on out in the world right now. And then the person uh, proceeds to list all kinds of different things, some of which we might end up talking about a little bit during this episode. Everything feels just so scary and so intense. And there is definitely a lot out there to feel unsure and anxious about. I've been thinking a lot recently about the phrase, uh, supposedly the curse, may you live in interesting times. And today we're going to be talking about how to relate to all of that and hopefully become a little bit more resilient, a little bit more grounded, a little bit more uh, confident about what we're actually going to do about any of this stuff. And to help us learn how to do that, I'm joined as usual by clinical psychologist, Dr. Rick Hansen. So dad, how are you doing today? I'm good. And um, I could not be more psyched, pumped. Um, about this topic. Yeah, this one could end up being a little bit different for us. I just want to kind of prepare people for that uh, before we get into it. And also to state the obvious, we are not a politics podcast. We are not a uh, uh, what's going on in society podcast. That is just not what we do. We're a mental health podcast. So our lens is mental health. I do think that a major mental health issue for people these days is what's going on collectively. As they say, the personal is political, the political is personal. These worlds are very much wrapped up in each other. But I think part of what we're going to be talking about is how to feel at least something resembling a little bit of healthy separation between all of that panic-inducing stuff that's out there and what's actually going on more immediately in our lives. And I want to kind of toss the ball your way, Dad, and just uh, ask you, how are you thinking about all of this stuff these days? Well, partly I want to toss the ball back to you with a rhetorical question. <laughs> okay, In other words, I might say, why are people so freaked out by mm. all kinds of measures compared to 10 years ago or 100 years ago or 1,000 years ago? It's simply true that the standard of living is better than ever. The opportunities, certainly around the world, uh, for women are, are vastly better, with many exceptions, and it's obviously long overdue processes, than they've ever been in history. Uh, in America, there's been tremendous movement in civil rights. Again, long overdue, terrible stain on our, on our nation's history that you know still has repair that's required. That said, much better access to information, good chocolate, good beer, good music, <laughs> all kinds of good stuff. Sure. Yeah. So what why me worry? What's the worry about? Now I'm asking so this that is question. Really, this is really interesting, Dad, because because I think it's a good question. And and you're also doing a kind of uh, inversion of our typical dynamic here. I'm normally the person who's a little bit more um a little bit more temperate or, or making that argument to some degree, whereas you tend to be more the person who's like, hey, here's all the stuff that we should be freaked out about. And so you're <laughs> you're inverting our typical dynamic good, here and sort good. of forcing me to wear the other hat. Yeah. Um, I would say that those things are mostly true. And yet the lived experience of a person is not relative. It's immediate. Yeah. So relatively, of course the world is a more pleasant place to live in by and large in 2024 than it was in uh, 224. But I wasn't living back then. So yeah. I don't have I, I don't have that comparison point. That's a kind of theoretical comparison in my mind. It's not in my lived experience. And the lived experience these days for most people, I think, is if you are paying any attention at all to what's happening in uh, in Israel and Palestine and Ukraine in the United States of America politically, things that are going on in many other parts of the world that I I don't even have the um, the awareness or the knowledge to name. I'm sure. Layered on top of that, a overall feeling uh, of a kind of slowing down. If you are living in a lot of Western countries, of a incredible economic rocket ship. That has been strapped to us for basically the last 50 years, more or less. A feeling that uh, people these days are not accessing education or healthcare, perhaps in some cases, as easily as their parents did. A feeling of a pushing back of various benchmarks. Uh, people are getting married later. They're having kids later. The cost of college has completely exploded in the United States. Yeah. So there are all of these actual lived experience metrics that 
are huge for people. I, I don't know if I mentioned climate change in there. Hello, that's probably a big one. Climate change, that's a major source of existential anxiety for yeah. uh, many, many, many people, many of whom I'm sure listen to this podcast. And so that's maybe a little rundown of just a few of the things that a person might be really worried about these days. That being said, I do think that the kind of um, tongue-in-cheek argument that you made there in the intro, Dad, you know, the what me worry part of it, there is a at least a kernel of truth in that argument that I think it can be helpful to lean into a little bit sometimes when we feel ourselves sort of swept away by these more big picture things. Yeah, I'm so glad you said all that. And to be clear, I asked the rhetorical question <laughs> to, to <laughs> the question was very it. much yeah, yeah absolutely absolutely yeah. <laughs> right and so listening to you for us and kind of sorting what you're saying into we could say three piles uh, that help yeah. me simple minded me understand it uh, I think one pile is what we could call delusional anxiety sure. partly related to the negativity bias that um, has us foreground threats and also has us habituate to positive stimuli that are relatively stable and continuous. We don't pay attention to the stuff that's okay. Uh, we don't pay attention to the dog that did not bark, you know, as in the famous Sherlock Holmes story. We just let that go by. And so I, I think also social media has been a huge driver of what I'll call oh, yeah. delu sure. delusional anxiety, revving us up, disturbing us. So let's just call it that category. Then there's this second category that's really interesting in that, just think about if a typical Roman, you know, 2000 years ago, hanging out, you know, 100 years into the common era, if they were dialed into the state of the world, you know, the Visigoths, the Huns, the barbarians heading their way, the secret lives of the various Roman senators, if they had access to that kind of information, they probably would have been freaking out. They would have been really disturbed by, oh, all the, in other words, I'll call them bad things that were happening around the world that people in previous times had no way of knowing about. A huge part of this is just information availability, to your point. Yeah, the information. So this is the second category. We now have an unprecedented level of information about crummy things that were always already happening, but people just didn't know about. So now we know more about the craziness, the threats, the weirdness of the world. That's the second category. And then there's a third category in which unprecedented bad things are actually happening or could be happening that people are really worried about. So to me, these are these three categories and it's helpful to differentiate them just to kind of sort it out. And also it goes to how do we solve it? You know, how do we, because that'll be our focus here. How do we relieve anxiety and promote healthy action and resilience and coping? What do you think of those three categories? I think they're great categories. I also think that there's an absolutely essential fourth category, uh -huh. which is all of the normal day-to-day -day anxiety and uncertainty-provoking stuff. Yeah, uh, like a, a feeling of instability going on in your immediate life. Uh, not you got to go whether... see the dentist, and you hate dentists. I like dentists, by the way. I'm just yeah. want to say for the record, <laughs> it, it is sometimes our example work. of like I this liked... horrible thing out there. Yeah, for sure. We <laughs> I like should probably, we should probably for edit some that people, a little bit. They're pretty free, like your mother. You know, <laughs> she does out. hate dentists, or not hate them on a personal level. She hates yeah. going. Anyways, <laughs> yeah. all right. Yeah. I'm sure we've stepped in enough there already. Uh, so like real real stuff that's anxiety provoking in life or real things that a person is unsure about. Yeah. Uh, dealing with their health insurance. Am I going to be laid off from my job? Uh, will that person like me sure. that I also like? Like any level this can operate on. And yeah. something that I think is really important to name here just at the beginning, the greater our degree of uncertainty, generally speaking, the greater our degree of anxiety. These two things travel together. Um, they're closely paired to each other. Another piece of this is that the um, the greater the problem appears to be, or the more uncertainty there is about what I'll call the upper bound of a problem, the more worry we tend to experience. And there's this really interesting research on worry that suggests that we tend to worry more when there's not a lot that we can actually do about a problem, because the brain interprets that ruminatory process 
as doing something. It interprets it as action, even if the action is literally just taking place between our ears. So that's one of the reasons that these more sort of existential scaled problems can feel so worry-inducing and anxiety-provoking to us, even if, you know, a lot of the time what really affects our life in a negative way is the day-to-day -day stuff that we're just moving through, right? So there's this kind of funny imbalance between those two things. Well, two things here. First, I think we're going to focus mainly on the first three buckets uh, for a change in this podcast. <laughs> we normally focus on the fourth bucket, yeah. Totally. Yeah. And I think there's something really important about the deep down feeling that people have that is apprehensive. There's a kind of dread. There's an apprehensiveness. Uh, the future itself has become the condition stimulus, like the bell ringing for Pavlov's dog. People have related increasingly to the future as itself scary, itself um, a trigger for anxiety. So I think we're going to mainly focus on that. I want to then build on what you said about worry. That's really interesting because you're right. If I'm worried about uh, do I have enough tomato sauce to make the sauce for my pasta, I solve that worry really easily. It's bounded, it's specific, it's under my control. But you think about, you know, the falling apart of political institutions in America, global warming, it's big, it's vast, and it feels like there's very little we can do. So the, the worry cycle never completes. You know, tomato sauce, you're going to complete that worry cycle. But it's really hard to complete the worry cycle on what will be the state of the world in 15 years when it increasingly runs out of fresh water? ruh -roh. You know, so that tends to promote worry, worry, worry. And one of the things I hope we can talk about are useful ways to take charge of the worry process and, ha and engage in productive worry rather than yeah. ruminative, harmful worry. Okay, so maybe what we could do here is take a little bit of a step back and ask, how do most people engage with these issues? Like, what's, what's the framework of the way that we normally do this? So if you think about, I'm, I'm just mostly thinking about myself, but I'm also thinking about, you know, maybe uh, maybe you and mom during uh, certain other moments in time, previous election cycles, perhaps. <laughs> so how do people normally relate to this kind of a process? What do they do? Shoot the messenger. <laughs> they start by consuming an enormous amount of media, right? Uh, and yell at the television. Injecting it, <laughs> injecting it right into their veins, right? And what's going on in that media? Normally, it's not a lot of good news, right? If it bleeds, it leads. And this doesn't necessarily just have to be like politically loaded stuff. It could be um, your TikTok feed suddenly being flooded with uh, a lot of people seeming to kind of panic about whatever disorder or health issue or whatever else is like on the rise among people in your demographic, when it turns out that if you dig into the the actual like statistics on it, it's increased by like 3% or something. Right, right. So that's the first step is you consume a lot of media. What's the second step? You take that, um, the possibilities, the range of possible outcomes, you compress it into the absolute worst case scenarios. You catastrophize around those and you really internalize those as like, this is what will happen if fill in the blank happens. Then because we've made things enormous and undeal with a bull, we feel extremely helpless in the face of them, in the face of all of these uncontrollable things. And there's not a lot that we feel like we can actually do. So the brain does what it knows it can do, which is it starts to just worry about them. It starts mm. to ruminate. It starts to chew. It starts to churn, right? That cycle is never completed the way you were saying, Dad. And this then causes people to feel overwhelmed, exhausted, strung out, and uh, generally despondent about the state of the world. That's the typical pattern that most people seem to have about this stuff. Do you think that that's more or less right, Dad? Am I, am I being too kind of generalized or blasé about this, or, or does that more or less match your experience? I think this is your version of the Kubler-Ross stages of, uh, <laughs> of grief. <laughs> and uh, you, should, you should really develop this for us. I'm kind of serious. The stages, I sort of nominate um, maybe one final stage which has to do with forming group identity with others sure, who agree yes. with you about your worry. Yes. And you kind of hate or you know, are appalled by or both uh, those who do not share your worry. 
Yes. Okay. I'm, I'm really glad that you said that, Dad, because something that I've been a little leery about talking about for, for I hope, understandable reasons, but I do think that it's worth naming here, is that one of the things that's happened in the general discourse is that your level of concern has become a proxy for how good a member of this in-group you are. Right. If you are concerned, but your concern is sort of moderate and manageable and you know you're trying to go about your day and get through things and yeah also you care about that if that's sort of your your treatment of it you are considered not a good member of that group and i think that that's like a huge part of it that ideological purity is demonstrated by buying into the worst case scenario and that's just an, a natural a natural source of incredible anxiety for people it makes me think about the role of anger and some of the more psychoanalytic kinds of thinking about the roots of paranoia. The idea being, when I think about what it's like to be this person who feels at the effect of vast forces, economic, cultural, e ecological, political, et cetera, vast forces that are, that are bad, what's the reaction of that person? And understandably, I think it's anger. You know, one of the major responses that we have to threat is anger. So what's the role of anger in the mind of people who are feeling anxious about things, particularly vast social forces? There's often a lot of anger mixed into it, including a sense of grievance. And then that mm -hmm. anger and that grievance becomes part of group identity sometimes as well, as you were saying a moment ago. And then additionally, I'm just kind of mulling here, check me on this notion, that sometimes what people do is they take their anger or their own aggressiveness about something and then project it outward, maybe because they want to be a nice person, uh, whatever reason might be, they project it outward and then they see over there these aggressive, hateful, violent, angry forces also bearing down on them and in a way that kind of feeds a certain paranoia. You know, paranoia being one source of it, kind of projecting onto the world, your own aggressiveness and hatefulness, and then responding to a world that seems aggressive and hateful. I don't know. It's kind of a half-baked theory. Maybe it's one, maybe fraction of a good idea. I don't know. <laughs> maybe no good idea. I, th I think it's I think it's baked enough for a podcast. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So piecing this out a little bit, maybe. There are a couple of things that contribute to this feeling. For starters, like we we're saying in the very beginning, like real stimuli, there really is stressful, concerning stuff going on in the world. We're not trying to dismiss that or downplay that or anything. Like yeah. there are things the that opposite, are happening out there actually. that I'm that I'm freaked out about. Yeah. And so that's kind of like the obvious basis of what we're talking about today today. And then the question is, okay, like how do you respond to that in relatively healthy ways if you can? And I think that a big piece of this puzzle does get to seeing reality clearly, and that does require, to some extent, a sense of perspective. This is going to maybe sound like a little bit of a, of a digression, but stick with me here. There's this great video um, from a huge creator on YouTube. I think it's pronounced Veritasium. It's titled, The Four Things It Takes to Be an Ep Expert. And in this video, he gave an example of Philip Tetlock, who wrote the book Expert Political Judgment. And for a couple of decades, this guy, Philip, uh, asked all of these political experts, journalists, economists, policy specialists, academics, all of those types of people, a bunch of questions about current events. And then he asked them to assign a probability of outcome, like how likely are these various outcomes that I'm going to give you to a bunch of possible outcomes. And these were questions he asked, like, will the dot-com bubble burst? Would this president or that president be reelected? And he did this for years and years and years and years. And at the end of this whole process, he had tens of thousands of data points because he had asked all these different experts all of these different questions. How accurate were they? Do you have any guesses? My guess is that there was a sub there was a subgroup whose predictions were really quite high, but most people. Uh, weren't. And this kind of relates to something I was told a long time ago, like in the commodities futures markets, something like um, all the money is made by 11% of the players, the other 89% routinely lose their money. That could totally be the case. There might have been a subset inside of this large sample of 
experts, like true experts. Yeah. Uh, these were people who had uh, graduate degrees. They were their job was in this field. They were paid to do this work. Like these are the people you want to talk to about this stuff. So how did they actually do? They did awful. They yeah. performed worse than if they just assigned an equal probability to all possible outcomes. The, you're saying the average, the average. Yeah. I suspect alongside that average, there were some who were really good. But okay. Yeah, and I suspect that in any sample, in any sample data of thousands of experts, you will have some of them who perform very well because of random chance in terms oh, of distribution. Forest. So that is the way it works. That's I would bet on work. you. So <laughs> I've interviewed you about politics for the last fifteen years. I, I appreciate that, Dad. Young Bella, that. and you've been right most of the time. I'm sure I've just forgotten a lot of the times when I was wrong. But anyway, so what's the point about this? The point about this is not don't trust experts. If that's the takeaway, we've, we've gone to a really messy place. The point <laughs> is that their predictions were inaccurate because these are extremely low sample size events. Mm. There were things like, will Quebec secede from Canada? We just oh. haven't had a situation like that before, so we can't yeah. make good judgments about the future. Black Most swans. of the things... Yeah. Yeah, most of the things that are freaking people out these days feel like black swan events. And what that means is just that we don't have enough information to be able to make really accurate predictions. Unfortunately, on the one hand, uncertainty tends to create more anxiety. This can be anxiety provoking when we really don't know what's going to happen. On the other hand, it means that we can maybe lighten up a tiny little bit, just a tiny little bit, about our certainty of the bad outcome our certainty about just how bad it will be if X happens, because we just don't know really what's going to happen here. And that can be a kind of precarious place for people to be, right? That can be pretty uncomfortable to feel that kind of lack of confidence in your own view. This is deeply interesting. And I finally followed the setup. I mean, there you were like a Hall of Fame pitcher. Yeah. <laughs> You were winding up on the mound. I'm, I'm sorry I, if that was way too long, by the way. Also no, it was perfect, actually. It's like the setup for a great joke with a killer punchline. You know, this political scientist. I, I had to build to it. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, what is he getting at? You know, but now I get it. It's about like confidence. How, how confident should we be in view is the real question here. Yeah. You're saying that um, basically many, many of the things that seem threatening and thus worrisome today um, are categorically unprecedented. So they're categorically harder to make predictions about. And so yeah. therefore, we're left with a much wider range of uncertainty, which then really stirs up underlying apprehensiveness and anxiety. Yeah, and you can relate to that either way. It's it's a little bit of a glass half wow. full, glass half empty thing. It could turn out way worse than we think it will. Like, I'm not saying it's going to turn out better. I'm just saying that the range of outcomes is really wide here. And it's a, it's I think it can be valuable to appreciate that whole range. That's really, really deeply interesting. Yeah. I'm glad you think so. I kind of I kind of sprung that uh, that whole thing on Rick here just for listeners. He was not prepped for that one. Oh, no, not at all. Yeah. Okay, so how do you deal with it? So let's say, play it out. What's the bottom line? Everything could turn to crap, yeah. right? There could be, you know, I've worried about thermonuclear war my whole life. Uh, to out Rick, as I've done a little bit in the past, he's kind of a secret prepper. Like not really, but like a little tiny bit. You got a prepping boat in your body. It's it's not that he's dug the bomb shelter, but he's <laughs> fantasized about digging the bomb shelter a lot. I've thought about what I would put in it and uh, and all the rest of that. Because, you know, historically, we've just literally been one Russian colonel away from World War Three. And that also, not to interrupt you Go here, on. Dad, but like that's kind of a piece of it too. Yes, yeah. these things feel... Like this moment is the scariest moment that has ever been. It I just do not categorically know if that's a true thing. Yeah. I mean, like you were saying, we were one person in a submarine away from nuclear winter, like probably many times yeah. in the sixties and seventies. And so it's like good to just have a little context here. Oh, truth. Okay, so play to good for you. All right, here we are. Mm -hmm. Play it out. You know, whatever your your worst case scenario might be. I I, for example, have people who I know is very educated, intelligent, rational people. Sure. Who, in terms of the histogram of possibilities related to global warming, 
are fairly convinced that we're heading towards civilizational collapse sometime yeah. in the next 20 years, if not sooner. And they make a case for it. Wow. Uh, yeah. And 20 then you, years? Damn. All right. Okay. Yeah, wake up. So that's what they would say. <laughs> this guy right. really is falling. Anyway. Uh-huh. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. You know, there are arguments on the other side. I don't want to alarm people, et cetera, et cetera. But if you were to play it out, how do you come to terms with the ultimate bad possibility? How well, do you do it? I think there's a slightly more cynical and a slightly less cynical answer here. And I don't, I don't know if this is, I don't know if people will necessarily experience this as actually cynical. But if you push these things out to their furthest extent, part of the question that you're asking yourself is like, what's your relationship with dying? Yeah. Um, and or species extinction for yeah for for some of these things um the widest possible view can be a little helpful uh like if that's the way truly things go there is literally nothing that i can do about it in my life other than live a good life if we've gotten to the point where the clock's not just ticking but it's actually struck midnight and yep. we're just living in the reverb here okay well then there's nothing to do we we live well meanwhile um, we try to make peace. We try to have as enjoyable and functional a 20 years as we can. And you go from there. I, I think that there's something about that where there can be a feeling inside of ourselves where we are unwilling to accept that mm. as just the way that things are. And this, I think, kind of moves us toward a, a healthier model, a healthier version of, of what I was describing. It's acceptance and agency, man. It's being well classics over and over again. We're accepting that this uncertainty, this wide range of outcomes, is a part of life. We just don't know. We have more confidence, we have less confidence, but end of the day, man, it's really hard to know. And that place of not knowing is initially often extremely uncomfortable for people, but then we tend to develop more comfort with it over time as we mm -hmm. practice it. Then from there, I think that you can develop a sense of yourself as a person, as something that you really can rely on even when things go to shit, even when the world out there is scary, you can keep on making good decisions and you can trust yourself. And I think the third stage of that is it's dealing with a lot of emotions that come up. Mm. I think what a lot of people are going through right now is actually just grief in kind of a simple word, that that's yeah. really the emotional experience that's happening. It's, it's anxiety, but it's also grief. Grief about what? Well, grief about real things that are happening broadly in the world but also a kind of grieving for the future exactly. for other people. Yeah, totally. That's sort of part of it. And then I think that working with that grief is a huge part of the process. For me, a lot of that, again, comes back to like, what can I do? And that's a, a natural resource for me. And it's something that does tend to really help me regulate my emotions. Yeah. Like, who is this feeling serving? What can I actually do if I act upon it? All of that kind of stuff. Uh, that may or may not be a helpful resource for the people listening. So that's kind of where I would start with, with most people. We're accepting uncertainty. We're developing a sense that there are things we can do locally, and we really lean into those things on the basis of feeling like we're a sturdy, stable, capable person. And then we're in the emotional regulation part of it. We're dealing with the emotions as they come up. We're releasing them. We're letting them go if we can. We're seeing if we can relate to them in healthier ways. And for a lot of this stuff, that's kind of what's there. And that can be a little depressing to be real about that, that that's really what's there. But I think there's a truth in it that that can be helpful for people. I feel in some ways your response there, in a, in a way, is the, the finish line of the episode. Now we're mm, going to keep mm -hmm. going, but you really are yeah. getting to it. I want to say back to you a few things that I pulled out from what you said there. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to reverse our roles here as well. Uh, first, it seems to me that if you look back in the last 20 years in the developed world, there's been an increase in micro certainty, or let's say a decrease in micro uncertainty. In other words, there's more predictability about the basics of daily life in a lot of ways. Um, will there be beer that I care for at the grocery store when I go? That, that kind of thing. So micro uncertainty has decreased, but macro uncertainty, uncertainty about large macro scale events has really been on the rise. That understandably mm -hmm. gives rise to anxiety because there's more uncertainty there. Second, how to be about it. One of the keys, I think, is to tease apart anxiety 
from grief. And related to grief, I would add a kind of moral trauma in that we know that we are robbing young people of a certain kind of future by virtue of pouring, literally, 100 million tons a day of CO2 into the sky. We can feel really like we're participating. We can't help it, but we're participating in some terrible things that are happening. So that's kind of akin to the grief. But I think it's helpful to separate grief from anxiety because the anxiety can be managed. As you say, if you can accept acceptance and agency, the worst case outcome, like it would be terrible and at some level, you know you can't change it, you can't stop it, you don't want it, you fight against it, but there's acceptance. That's that's very real. And then, then you close the cycle on anxiety. Also, alongside that, you do everything you can. Uh, and I think part of that, for many people, it's to really recognize that there are things you can actually do about the, the broad forces that seem threatening to you. There are things you can actually do related to preserving democracy and, you know, reducing the movement toward authoritarianism in whatever country you happen to be in, or you can find places in that country that are, you know, more protected for you rather than less protected. There are things you can do. There are things to some extent many people can do uh, vis-a-vis, you know, global warming um, to do your part to reduce it, but also to become more climate resilient. There are things you can do to whatever extent you can do them. So I think one of the takeaways here is to take your anxiety seriously and to ask yourself, well, if I'm getting increasingly unnerved about the political direction in my country, hmm, do I want to move? And I'm not at all being glib about that. I just mean to take seriously the stuff that you're worried about. And then also do what you can so you know you've done what you can for the greater good, which also can address some of the grief because at least you've done what you can and you know that. So I think there's a lot in that that we're talking about here. Just practically, I think what happens with a lot of these issues is that people feel swept away at the largest possible scale. When the problems get bigger and bigger and bigger, our sense of what we can do about them gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Yeah. But the truth is that if we scale down the problem a little bit, all of a sudden we're capable of doing a lot locally. If we're not thinking necessarily at the scale of uh, hundreds and millions of tons of CO2, or, or I don't know what the exact number is, but big number. But we're thinking at the scale of like, okay, can I start a recycling program at my yeah. local whatever? That's a real thing you can do. Is it a drop of, is it a grain of sand on a grain of sand on a grain of sand? Yes. And you accept that. You're okay with that. You're like, look, I know that it's a grain of sand on a grain of sand on a grain of sand but it's my grain of sand, so I'm going to do what I can. And that helps us feel good. That's That helps us uh, build self-worth and self-confidence and a feeling like there are things we can do. Something we haven't really talked about so far are huge swaths of social justice-related issues. Many, many places where you can volunteer or contribute or just try to be a good person to people who are one or two or three rungs lower on the social ladder than you are. Like there's all of this stuff that is actually possible for a person if they really want to contribute. Um, And sometimes I find it kind of interesting that people are so fixated on the fear attached to what they can't actually really do anything about. And and I wonder about it, not to get too psychoanalytic here, but as a little bit of almost a protective mechanism, like it's a way to defend against um, what they actually could be doing or against the feeling like they need to be doing something more locally in their life. It's an easy out to just say, well, you can't boil the ocean. Oh, yeah, yeah, no. (laughs) Grr. Well, (laughs) and we could just we just go down. We could just go on this for a while. I'll clearly we both have feelings about it. But but I think that what I'm really emphasizing here is just the behavioral activation piece of this. That's right. Doing is a solution to an awful lot of anxiety. So a big part of the question here is what can you do? Like what can you actually do concretely in your life to feel just a little bit better about this stuff? It's my tentative opinion, subject to correction, that I think 
roughly 80% of the population is worried about real things that they are not doing realistic things. Oh, for sure. For. Oh, yeah. And, and that's a bit of a full, nudge. Full cosine. Yeah. Yeah. If you're worried about the impact on you of a changing job market or, you know, microplastics being released into the atmosphere and showing up in breast milk and all the rest of that or whatever it might be, take it seriously. I mean, if you're worried about nuclear war, which is not a crazy thing to be worried about, how would you take it seriously if you actually were concerned about it and given the parameters and the realism of your life without becoming a doomsday prepper or getting into craziness? But what could you do? Could you stockpile, if you're worried about earthquakes, could you stockpile a reasonable amount of water? You know, right? Could you put a go bag in your car? Could you do kind of normal range things? And I'm not saying any of these things to diminish the seriousness of the threats. I'm saying really take them seriously. Listen to your anxiety and consider what you could actually do that over the next five to 10 years could position you to, you know, something of a better place. Could at least improve yeah. your, your odds of things going well if that black swan sails into your harbor. I, I think what's cool about that exercise, Dad, is the act of making a list where you truly sit down and go, if I were going to do something about it, this is what it would look like. Given your life circumstances, you might look at that list at the end of that process and go, this is freaking crazy. Yeah. I'm not going to do any of this stuff. Are you? I'm not going to. I'm not going to leave the country. I've got a, a yeah. three year old kid, and I I don't have the money. Yeah. And like, what are we even talking about here? Oh, you, no, I'm I'm actually definitely not going to uh, volunteer after work every day at my local whatever because I get home and I'm tired and I'm worn out and and my my spouse understandably wants a relationship with me and and I've got all these other needs I got aging parents and I'm just I'm just not going to do that. Yeah. Then you can complete a cycle about it because exactly. you've actually gone through the real process of going through like okay what could I do and then you make a choice and what's powerful here is the making of the choice just exactly. as much as whatever choice you That's end right. up making. Yeah. Yeah. And you're basically saying the cost of reducing this risk is greater than the anticipated probabilistic yes. benefits to me. And knowing all that, I'm going to live with that risk. Yeah. And at the point that you go, look, I'm showing up on November 5th. I'm getting out there. My vote will be counted. I know who I'm voting for. There it is. Okay. And you also look yourself in the mirror and you go, no, I'm not in fact going to move to Canada. And, uh, you know, i just kind of set on those two things and I'm going to continue to be a good social citizen and I'm going to do what I can meanwhile and I'm going to try to contribute in other areas of my life, I think that there is really a place to ask yourself, are, are you just getting more anxiety from your TikTok feed or are you actually getting more value from it? And there's, there's an important kind of meta question about all of this, which is what's the right amount of worry? The answer is clearly the amount that leads to you doing whatever you're going to do about it. Yeah. And yeah. that's it. Every amount of worry from there on is just pain without gain, right? And I think being really real about that, really honest about that, can be very helpful here because it can help you move through the anxiety to whatever the, the other emotions are that the anxiety is kind of currently shielding. You know, there's an aspect of this that I want to foreground, which has to do with our felt sense of connection with others in our communities and in our country, and even a felt sense of connection with humanity as a species, and even more broadly, a felt sense of connection with all of life. And so some of the worry is not so much about how it will affect me, but rather- Oh, how, for sure. Yeah, yeah. How it will affect my country. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And particularly vulnerable people, let's say, in my country. And also looking out into the world, humans are causing mass species extinctions, right? At an unprecedented scale. And, and that's the scale. grief aspect of it. Yeah. Yeah. And, we, and it's happening. So it's because we feel connected uh, that we 
we feel bad. That's one of the sources of our worry and our grief. And so uh, sometimes I think people say, hey, uh, you're going to be fine, you know, global warming, whatever. You live in a wealthy country. What, you know, why are you whining? Eat, drink, and be merry, and all the rest of that. And even if that's true, gosh, what about the, I don't doubt for us, roughly a billion people will die of hunger over the next 50 years due to climate change. And that's probably a lowball estimate. Look, this is not intended as what me worry, okay? Yeah. And it is not intended as, hey, just stick your head in the sand. Yeah. That's the way to feel better about it. It's also not intended as, hey, lean on your privilege. You know, somebody like me, I could just kind of be okay, sort of whatever happens here. I'm not in a vulnerable group of people. I'm a straight white guy. It's yeah. probably going to work out okay for me anyways. Historically, things have worked out pretty well for straight white men. I'll probably continue to be okay. Like, that's that's not the point here. Like, that's yeah. not how, how to go about controlling your anxiety, although I admit there are aspects of that that do help me control my anxiety because I can recognize, yeah, I'm a privileged person in this equation here. It's more about allowing the feeling of real instances of agency, real instances of contribution, real examples of you truly being supportive of a more vulnerable group of people. Yeah. Are you truly caring about really what's going on inside of that friend's life who's going to be much more directly affected by whatever happens here politically or socially or whatever else? Those are often the ways that you can contribute. And by localizing on them, my dread meter goes down. Huh. Not because I'm not worried about all of that other stuff, but because I've gotten real about what is within my personal bubble of influence, including, frankly, just like stuff we do on the podcast, what we talk about, having a conversation about this, trying to be an advocate for different stuff that I care about, whatever it is, like that's my way in. And those are all actions, right? The more time that I spend inside of my brain just cognizing about this stuff without actually doing much about it, the worse my quality of life gets. And I suspect that as that quality of life goes down, so too do my actual contributions because I've de-resourced myself. You know, you can't pour from an empty cup here. And, and I think that that also is a big piece of this. A couple things stand out for me in just what you're saying there. The first is that it's really helpful to be able to categorize and tease apart different things that preoccupy us. For example, as you may know, there's research on how just simply labeling what we're experiencing at the time, the short, simple, accurate label, a noting practice sometimes called, actually reduces activation of the amygdala, the alarm bell in the brain, and increases activation in executive regions behind the forehead. Good. In much the same way, we can sort out, oh, I'm worried about these large macro scale, categorically uncertain forces that can affect me and my possibilities of buying a house or going to college or finding a mate or living a long, good life. And okay, I can address that. Then there's another category that has to do with however I might be affected or not affected. There are all these other beings who are being affected or will be affected that I care about, and I worry about the impact on them, and I feel grief about it. It's helpful to separate those. That, that alone is useful. And then additionally, I would add that it's helpful with regard to grieving to know that grieving is loving. We don't grieve unless we love. We grieve the loss of friends. We, leave, we grieve the loss of a future. We grieve the impact on others fundamentally as a kind of love. And being aware of that love that underlies the grief can help us bear the grief better and kind of allows us to metabolize the grief and not, and not be overwhelmed by the grief. As we get toward the end of the episode here, Dad, the piece of it that I would love your take on is that aspect that's more about, I don't know what's going to happen, and that really freaks me out. Or... Um, the possibility of some bad future outcome. And we can even localize this down a little bit into things that are a little bit more personal. For example, 
Um, somebody who has a, a history of cancer inside of their family, they have no current symptoms, but they're really worried that this thing is going to happen to them in the future. And there's mm -hmm. uncertainty attached to it. I think that's a good proxy for some of these big picture things. There's several things that I'll just offer here that I might be helpful. One is central to Buddhism, particularly early Buddhism, is the recognition of impermanence. Hmm. A visceral, felt, pervading recognition of impermanence continually of all phenomena. And more and more as we accept impermanence, including the present moment impermanence, very granularly of our thoughts, our feelings, our perceptions, our, our sense of who we are moment to moment to moment, and we move into the accepting of that. Increasingly and interestingly, people feel more and more at peace. It's paradoxical. It's kind of like you step out and you recognize that everything is ending endlessly. And that could be deeply alarming. But you also recognize that everything is arising endlessly. We're being lifted. It's kind of like stepping out into an elevator shaft uh, while being lived and uplifted continually by an updraft. There's a deep line, you know, everything that is subject to arising is also subject to passing away. There's then an application of that to your own life. And there's a lot of emphasis in Buddhist psychology about not clinging to that which will pass away. You know, we get anxious about can I hold on to that which will inevitably disperse or decay. All eddies in the stream of reality disperse eventually. So we try to hold on to it, but that holding on uh, makes us tense, makes us stressed, gets us preoccupied with ourselves, leads us into all kinds of actions with others that are not good, maybe related to possessiveness or positionality. And when we're centered in an awareness of impermanence, that naturally takes us into practices of holding life lightly as it passes through our hands, as it were, um, without getting involved in the friction and thus the suffering of clinging. And then there's a particularly, I would say, Buddhist wisdom about realizing that much as all phenomena are impermanent, they are also dependently arising. In other words, what reality consists of really is relationships and processes, not discrete things. So we get caught up in the story of our life as a discrete entity, Rick, Forrest, Bob, Mary, and so forth. Um, when in fact, you start realizing that what you take to be yourself is much more like, you know, a temporary impermanent wave in the ocean. Brought into being by all these causes, the expression of the ocean as a whole locally, dispersing inevitably, whose nature all, all along was water. And this could be merely philosophical in the beginning, but over time it becomes very felt, very felt. And yes, there's mourning and grieving because grieving is loving. You love others. You love your life. You love the possibility of being here tomorrow and all that it might come. So, of course, we grieve the anticipation of an end to that. Very understandably. That's perfectly okay. That's normal for this big scared monkey to do, while also, hopefully, we can also develop wisdom about the inevitable dispersing of all the coming togethers that constitute our life. And in the knowing of that inevitable dispersing, we can have a real felt sense of peace about the ongoingness that has always been the case of what we will eventually disperse into. I think it would be great if along similar lines, you offered something here from your long experience talking to people and working with people related to that feeling of grief. Because yeah. we've talked a lot about fear, we've talked about a lot about anxiety, yeah. but we haven't so much talked about the, the sadness and grieving aspect of it that I think is incredibly real for a lot of people. Well, thank you for that invitation. Um, I'll, I'll be brief or try to be. Uh, I think first it's really helpful to open to grief and to normalize it and to name it, especially if you are a person uh, for whatever reasons, culture, gender socialization, 
that tends to um, approach life with a stiff upper lip, buck up, move on. Yeah, I think that's been a big theme here in general with all of these experiences emotionally that we're talking about, the, the acceptance of the existence of them. Yeah, and so it's normal. And in fact, it's beautiful to grieve because like I said, grieving is loving, grieving is valuing. Uh, it's, we, we grieve the loss of the things we value and that valuing usually is entirely or certainly mainly wholesome. So, you know, that, that would be step one, I think, is to name it, to allow it, to open up to it. And there's a little sidebar here about resourcing yourself so you can bear the grief it may be that you just touch it and you swing back out of it, like Peter Levine talks about pendulating, like a pendulum swinging in and swinging back. But in any case, you you let it flow. You open to it. Second, uh, is you know Chris Kermer and Kristen Neff talk about it. There's something lovely in recognizing our common humanity in grieving. Other people grieve. They are facing similar losses too. Uh, to be human is to grieve. You can even see it in other animals or these very, very poignant videos of mother elephants grieving over the death of their calf. Feel it. Let yourself feel it. Honor it broadly and feel the common humanity in it. And then I think it's important to not get stuck in the grief. And one way that people get stuck in the grief is they ruminate about it or they go into their head about it which then perpetuates it, kind of makes it stagnant. And instead, try to feel it, try to let it flow. Feel it in your belly, feel it in your body, open to it, um, don't resist it, you know, really let it flow. And then I think it's okay to start shifting increasingly into being in touch with the lovingness that underlies grieving and even be in touch with that lovingness as you get in touch with the grieving and move into move into repair. And that's something really touching too. You know, it's better to light a single candle than to curse the darkness. And so even as we grieve, for example, um, the loss of rainforest, plant a tree. It's not that your tree is gonna replace hundreds, thousands of square miles of land that's clear cut and will never be the same. It's just that you're doing what you can that's reparative. And that, that too is a really important practice with grief. And then last, I think, share with others. We're not meant to grieve alone. Think about the nature of our hunter-gatherer bands. There was loss all the time, routinely, like children. I think the uh, survival rate to age six, um, roughly one in six kids in a hunter-gatherer band made, made it to their sixth birthday. So think of the losses there, five out of six little kids not making it to their first, you know, to their six-year-old birthday. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're meant to share grief. We're meant to talk about it. Uh, we're not meant to grieve alone. People tend to be often very private about their grief, and I respect that. But also, grief is meant to be shared with other people. Um, so that would be the last thing I would suggest here. This has been a really interesting one. I, I have to admit that as I... Um... You know, as I get to the end of this one, there is a part of me that has a certain amount of uh, anxiety about the reception of it. I'm very <laughs> curious what people will think about this one. I hope that I didn't get uh, too out over my skis and the many different ways that, you know, I potentially could have during this one. But I think it's an important topic and I'm glad that we talked about it. Yeah. To really underline the point here, there really are categorically unprecedented threats facing humanity and individual humans. And it's really appropriate to take them seriously and listen to and honor your anxiety in ways that are productive for you, that move you forward in your coping and your well-being vis-a-vis uh, -vis those things. And then we're also in complete support of the highly individual approaches that people will find to be wise in their own case, in their own place, with regard to those real things. Today we talked about dealing with the feelings of anxiety and grief and just a general sense of fear and concern about everything that's going on out in the world right now. And this was a bit of a different episode for us. Uh, we generally do not talk about topics like this on the podcast. 
We aren't a politics podcast. That's not our area of expertise. But I do think that there is a natural flow between the personal, what's going on in our lives and our own mental health, and what's going on out in the world. Obviously, these two things affect each other. And throughout the conversation, we focused on what a person can actually do inside of their individual life. And one of the major topics that we explored was how can we find a sense of agency? How can we find a sense that there really is something that we can do, even amidst all of these various crises that feel so enormous in their scale, where anything that we would do is just the tiniest drop in the largest bucket. I'm not going to solve climate change on my own here. And that's true, but it's also just one piece of the puzzle because very, very large groups of people are made up of individuals. Any one individual may not be able to do a lot on their own, but we can accomplish great things together. So part of the question here is what we're doing inside of our own lives to support the large movements that we value. And that's something that we didn't really talk about very much during the episode that I wish that we had. The importance of relationships here how the single best thing you can probably do, both to support other people out in the world and to actually improve your outcomes in the future if something bad does happen, is to invest in your relationships, to invest in an underlying sense of community, to give time to the extent to which you can give time to the causes that you care about, to support them in other small ways. Is there a way where you can set aside a dollar a week? Are there things you can do maybe to nudge other people who are, say, unlikely voters? Uh, Are there things that you can do to educate yourself a little bit more about issues related to the ones that you really care about? Yes, these are very small acts, but when enough people do them out in the world, for starters, they really can make a difference. And maybe just as importantly, they can make a difference in your life by giving you an increased sense of agency, a sense of yourself as somebody who can actually make a difference, uh, a belief in yourself as somebody who is capable of solving problems and dealing with challenging emotions, even when crazy stuff is happening out there. And that's the target that we're aiming for, the sense of both resilience and contribution when it comes to the difficult things that are going on out in the world. We're trying to increase our resilience by focusing on three different pathways. First, getting more accurate in our appraisals of what is going on out in the world, including getting more accurate about Uh, our own inaccuracy, our inability to predict things accurately, and therefore the need to develop a degree of comfort with uncertainty. Then second, dealing with all of the emotions that come up throughout this process, the grief that we have for what's happening to other people, the fears that we have about the future, the anxiety that is maybe pushing away other even larger existential fears that we might have about what's going to happen to us or our kids or the human race as a whole. And then third, opening the door to what we can actually do to be more of a contributor. Maybe this means contributing more to one of those big picture issues that we talked about during the conversation. But maybe it just means contributing more inside of your very local life, inside of your family, inside of your local community, because you've dealt with some of the anxiety that was wearing you down. And to go back to the beginning of the episode, two things can be true at the same time. The first thing that can be true is that we we really do face massive challenges as a as a human race, as a global community, and for many people, they face massive challenges inside of their lives as well, layered on top of all of that. That can be really true. And then what can also be true is there are all of these other circumstantial factors that are going on, many of which are tied to our individual behavior that are massively turbocharging the pain that we are directly experiencing. And it's worth noting here that very powerful people are very incentivized to make you feel like there's nothing you can do, to make you feel small, worn down, like there's nothing that you can contribute to the world, to amplify the sense of panic because people make bad decisions when they're panicked. And when we scale up the the problems to a level where, oh man, there's nothing we can do about it, so let's just throw our hands up, they get to do more of what they want to do. A big piece of the problem here is the model that most people have related to these kinds of big picture issues, which for most of us starts with way too much media consumption, Uh, particularly way too much consumption of a certain kind of media that is mostly there to make people feel angry or uh, to make them feel afraid, as opposed to actually educating them about what's going on out in the world. We then take that pre-selected information that's being beamed into our phone and we catastrophize around it. We uh, overestimate how confident we should be 
in this small range of very, very bad outcomes at the worst end of the distribution. We then take that information, we catastrophize around it, we have this intense sense of helplessness because the problem has become so big and so catastrophic that, hey, there's nothing I can do about it. The overall feeling of uncertainty amplifies the sense of worry. This leads to all of these cycles of rumination because the brain defaults to what it knows it can do, which is worry about the problem. What's a healthier model? Well, it probably starts with acceptance. Accepting that there's only so much that we can do. Accepting that bad things will continue to happen. Uh, they will continue to happen regardless of how much we do individually. They will probably continue to happen regardless of how much we do as a collective. We also accept uncertainty. We accept that we're not going to really know, that we're never going to be able to predict the future as accurately as we would like. We accept our emotions, the grief that we feel about what's going on in the world, the fears that we have about our own life. Maybe we accept uh, more existential considerations that a person might have about death and dying and impermanence and you know the heat death of the universe, whatever it is that you're uh, you're worried about these days. Then maybe a bit counterintuitively, this acceptance of what we can't do, this acceptance of all the things we don't like that are true out in the world, can really focus us on what's actually available to us. And I loved that exercise that Rick mentioned, taking it seriously, writing out what would you actually do if, if I were going to take fill in the blank issue really seriously and really do something about it, what would I do? And that is an incredible exercise because it works both ways. It works if you look at that list and go, you know what? I really can do some of this. I really can do more than I thought maybe I could do. And it also works if you look at the list and you go, I'm not really going to do any of this stuff. Not practically, not during my life. My resources are low. There are a lot of demands upon me. I'm just not going to do that. And that process could really lower the feelings of anxiety that we have. Then as our anxiety goes down, our resources go up. We're feeling less of this stressful experience on the body. So maybe we start to feel a little bit more like, hey, there actually are things that I can do out there, right? And then as we move into action, we increasingly experience ourselves as people that we can rely on, even when the world out there is chaotic and messy and unstable and scary and dramatically unfair. Even as things change around you, you will be able to change with them. You will be able to make good choices. You will be able to intervene on your behalf and on the behalf of other people. I'd like to close this episode by talking about something that I hope is taken the right way. We love to say some version of we live in unprecedented times these days, and uncertain times and scary times. And that, at least to some degree, is true. But the truth is that humans have lived in unprecedented times for a long time now. 20 years ago was 9-11. 30 years ago was Rodney King. 50 years ago was Vietnam, 80 years ago was World War II. There were, there were literal Nazi rallies in New York, in Madison Square Garden in 1939. Tens of thousands of people attended these rallies. This isn't to diminish the challenges that we currently face. It's to emphasize our capacity to do something about them. We have faced difficult things in the past. We will face difficult things in the future. And so far, a bet on the human race has been a pretty darn good bet. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I am immensely curious in uh, how people respond to this one. I hope that it's positively. If you have hopefully good feelings about the episode and you would like to leave a positive rating and a review, you can do so on iTunes, on Spotify. You can, uh, what do they say, smash that like button on uh, YouTube. You can subscribe to the channel over there. You can subscribe to our podcast feed wherever you're listening to it now on. If you'd like to support us in other ways, you can find us on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash beingwellpodcast. And for the cost of just a couple dollars a month, you can support the show and you'll get a bunch of bonuses in return, including transcripts of every episode we've done over the last couple of years. Until next time, thanks for listening and I'll talk to you soon.